said that I don't know why I agreed to do that because I obviously whatever else I'm doing I have nothing to do with religious studies, right? For one. And uh, there's it goes in life generally. Maybe it's just like some contingent thing because in, in at some point in um, talking me into this thing, Matej, for example, invited me to his place and uh, I saw I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not revealing secrets. <laughs> I know what you are going to say. <laughs> and in, in, in his living room, I saw a big picture of Miles Davis. That was an idea. Okay, <laughs> I'll do that. Uh, so, um, but if seriously, if seriously, it is a bit of a problem because what I want to present today is sort of work in progress, and in general, it consists of three parts. And when thinking about it, uh, uh, how exactly to present it, I first realized that I cannot possibly present all three parts here. It's just like not feasible. But if I had to make a choice between the three, then which one am I to present? Uh, because the central part, uh, which pretty much gives the uh, title to, to this lecture and to this work generally. It's kind of more historical, but uh, as far as all my engagements uh, with history go, um, I'm pretty much interested in history, but in that particular part, I'm not doing any original historical research. So what I'm doing there, while looking at the work of uh, Cicero, St. Augustine, and uh, Machiavelli, I'm mostly kind of working with secondary sources, so I thought that maybe presenting that would not be particularly interesting. The third part, which <clears throat> is the main, would perhaps be too technical for an audience coming from outside of my immediate field, which is international relations, because it is really about some of the recent developments in the field of international relations theory. And that left me with the first part, which on second thought perhaps is the best one to present under any circumstances. Because in this part, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to set up my puzzle and my question. So in other words, I'm trying to say why what I'm doing is interesting, not just uh, for myself and what exactly about this is interesting. And this is usually, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the most difficult but also the most interesting part of, of any research project. I mean, since most of us spent uh, quite a few hours already uh, together today and since uh, the name of uh, Gadamer was mentioned there more than once, um, uh, at some point, Gadamer wrote that uh, finding your question is, in fact, finding your free space in the field. And that is the precondition for everything else that we are doing, because this is the precondition for being free. So I thought that, well, maybe I just spent some time on that. And maybe that would be interesting precisely because most of you, as far as I understand, are coming from outside international relations. And at the same time, most of you, this way or another, are interested not only in religious studies, but also in realism. And that in itself is already interesting and uh, again popped up uh, during our seminars during the day today because uh, as one would expect, the very understanding, the very definition of political realism may vary to a great extent across academic disciplines. So what political theorists mean by realism is often quite different from what international relations theorists mean by realism. And therefore, it certainly makes sense uh, to start with some definitions uh, what 
I personally would mean by political realism. And here I have to say that even within the field of international relations theory, my view may not necessarily be representative at all because there is not that much consensus on this in international relations theory. And one of the reasons why there is not that much consensus is because there is not that much debate. And this, I think, is not necessarily good at all. Now, the reason why there is not that much debate, I'll come to that as I go, but I start with my definition. And I think that international relations as an academic discipline, not as a tradition of thought, because uh, as a tradition of thought existed for a uh, considerably longer period of time, but as an institutionalized academic discipline was actually unusually lucky in coming up with a very precise, as it turns out, definition of uh, political realism basically from the very beginning. If you consider E. H. Carr's book, 20 Years Crisis, the first major work on international relations within, again, I'm stressing it, international relations as an academic discipline, then already there he's very clear as to what he means by political reality. And not only he is very clear, I also think that he is fundamentally correct in his understanding of political reality. Uh, so, what does he mean by political realism? Because later on people would mean different things for different reasons. And he basically, throughout his book, asks just one question. And the question in its most general form is, what is international order? Now, to answer this question, he asks a series of further questions, the first of which is, since any order, or certainly any political order, be it domestic or international, uh, exists only in virtue of there being rules and actors following these rules, then the next question is, why actors follow rules? Especially when this is not necessarily in their immediate interest. And this, of course, leads him to a further question. And this latest question is, OK, but what, are, what is the nature of rules? And from that, he finally arrives at his last question, so to speak, which gives him his definition of political realism. And this last question is, simply put, sounds like this. Uh, what comes first in this business of rule making and rule following? Ethics or politics? It's a very simple question at first, uh, which he answers very clearly that, of course, politics, uh, which is not, of course, for everyone, but which is, of course, for political realists. And this is what, in his view, and this is the view I basically agree with, it, this is what makes our political realism. An idea, and actually it's not an idea, it's a set of ideas. And it is a set of rather fundamental ideas, the first of which are uh, certainly not to be taken for granted by anyone, but wholeheartedly accepted by E. H. Carr. That first and foremost, politics and ethics are distinct and analytically distinguishable realms of experience. As the book progresses, especially towards the end of the book, uh, Carr uh, argues that, in fact, this distinction is not so easy to make, either in theory or in practice. But nevertheless, it is there, 
and it is absolutely fundamental. But that's only half of the story, because the other uh, premise, equally important and perhaps even much more important, is that not only ethics and politics are two separate uh, realms of experience, but in this complex of ethics and politics, politics is primary. This is the most realist point of Kar's political realism. Basically what he is saying, he is saying that yes, of course, we may and in fact we do have ideas which guide our conduct, guide our practices, guide our politics. But what matters is the origins of these ideas. These ideas are not innate, these ideas are not given and just accessible through reason. These ideas are our own creations and the only way for us to create these ideas and to endow them with any power is through our politics. Yes, later on, these ideas may take over, as it were, and start guiding our politics up to a certain point, but the origins of these ideas are always to be found in our political practices. Now, of course, what is very good about this kind of presentation of cars is his clarity about it. Uh, because unlike many after him, uh, Carr is not confusing his political realism with other forms of realism, such as, for example, philosophical realism. Political realism, as such, has nothing whatsoever to do in Carr's formulation with any ideas about reality, or reality and appearances, or, for example, material and ideational factors. You can take actually any of the positions on these philosophical issues and still be a political realist in Carl's view. Because in his formulation, this adjective political is actually as important as the noun realism. And they, they, they come together, they cannot be separated. And what Carl is also very clear about is uh, what for him and actually historically, what is the origin of all these basic assumptions that he makes and from which he starts. And the origin, of course, is Machiavelli. And Carr himself may be a disciple to some extent or the other of Hegel or Marx or more specifically Mannheim with his sociology and his studies of ideology. But, fundamentally, for him, modern politics and a little bit later, modern international relations begin with Machiavelli. And therefore, he has very little time and very little interest in other uh, figures very enigmatic for other political realists within international relations, such as Hobbes, for example, or Thucydides, or what have you. He's just not interested in that. But Machiavelli, yes, Machiavelli is important. And there is a reason for that, of course, because not only Machiavelli clearly holds to this same set of ideas, but it is quite safe to say that it is indeed with Machiavelli, or more generally speaking, with the Renaissance, that these ideas first make, make, made their appearance in a rather spectacular manner. And so did some of the problems with which realist tradition had to cope from that moment on. So just to remind you a well, otherwise well-known story uh, very briefly, uh, you all know that uh, the practitioners and the thinkers of the Renaissance struggled with this particular problem, how to assert the authority of the 
newly created Republican city-states in Italy within existing ideational or theoretical framework which actually did not allow for such thing to exist. Because the only relevant uh, theoretical framework at their disposal was that of the Roman law and if they were to follow uh, the body of the Roman law as they knew it, then it told them exactly what they didn't want to hear. That there could be only one authority and that was the authority of the emperor, of the empire. So, facing this tension, uh, some of the lawyers of the Renaissance came up with a truly revolutionary uh, idea which propelled the whole problem from the uh, realm of politics onto an altogether different level at which they asserted that in critical situations like this when theory and practice can no longer be unproblematically reconciled. Practice should take precedence over theory. So in their particular case, their politics should take precedence over existing body of law and should be accepted as creating law. Full stop. But that of course was easily said than done. It wasn't easy to say this thing but to, to live by this new kind of rule was even more difficult because, of course, this new idea, this new development immediately gave rise to the scary specter of might making right. Perhaps they didn't yet formulate it this way, but they clearly experienced it because from that moment on, the newly created political body of the Republican city-state, where its unity was now threatened from within by political factions. And they had to find a way of answering this challenge without falling back on the imperial model. And by the way, similar developments were happening in the relations between city-states when they had to come up with some compromise which would allow them to preserve their autonomy, to preserve their, what we would later call, uh, sovereignty, and yet not to tear themselves apart in never-ending war. So in international relations, they came up with this wonderful device that we call diplomacy, and this story is uh, documented by Matigny. Everyone knows this kind of classic study. Um, in domestic politics or political theory more generally, uh, the best known response to this problem is, of course, Machiavellian writings. And what Machiavelli comes up with in his specific response to this problem is pretty much the central problem of political realism in international relations after the first, but also after the second world war. Again, I'm not saying anything spectacularly new here when summarizing the nature of Machiavellian response. However, I have to stress that this response had been at the time and pretty much remained rather unusual, rather unorthodox. Because one way of characterizing his response, the new sort of value, the new good which he formulated in his work, would be stability. So stability becomes a value, maybe the primary value. But then, on the other hand, it's a strange kind of stability. It's a kind of stability which cannot be measured in longevity. And one of the reasons for that is because Machiavelli is not writing about any state. He is not writing about any republic. He is not writing about any priest. 
he is very specific uh, in his writing that all he is interested in is, is the predicament of the new prince in the new principality. He is not interested in established uh, principalities with unquestioned authority. He is not interested in princes who can ground their authority in something other than their own political action. And more importantly, when he says new, this new is not temporary. He doesn't even entertain this idea that, okay, today this prince is new and his principality is new, but say in 100 years time he would no longer be new and the problem will be gone. No. Pretty much like Trotsky's permanent revolution, his prince is always new. And his principality is always new. That's the <coughs> trick. Because the prince should always act as if he were new. And the principality should have its intrinsic resources for continuous ongoing self-regeneration. So the trick is precisely not to lose this new newness, this revolutionary character of the enterprise. And yet, to make sure that it survives, that it's stable without losing its character. And that is really a trick. And we pretty much know what Machiavellian, if we are to call it solution, what Machiavellian solution is. Because in Machiavellian formulation of it, any such principality would always be exposed to the vicissitudes of Fortuna, which is pretty much the rest of the world. And the only weapon the prince, the new prince, has in his possession in order to confront this Fortuna is his virtu. So the only way for him to somehow stand up to Fortuna is to continuously maximize his virtu or continuously maximize his grandezza. But the more he maximizes his grandezza, the more vicious virtu becomes. So stability uh, Machiavelli is writing about is the stability of a non-going political struggle, if you wish. And it is a stability of an equilibrium, but an equilibrium which is not a state of affairs, like a balanced system, but equilibrium which is an ongoing activity, like walking a highway, without ever planning to reach the end. You know? So this is really a new thing. And international relations theory after the First World War actually rediscovered it for, you, for itself. Although it used different terms, but in many ways it's talking about the same thing. Forget about Fortuna and call it anarchy, right? The condition of anarchy. Forget about virtu and call it national interest. Forget about grandezza and call it power. And what you get, you get security dynamics. Right? So every state, in order to ensure their survival in the anarchical environment, have to maximize their power. But maximization of their power th threatens other states, which then tend to sort of gain against this other state, which brings the whole force of anarchy onto the state in question. So actually, a rational conduct of maximization of one's own security, in the end, decreases everyone's security. So it's pretty much the same story as in Machiavelli, but with one difference. And at first sight, it seems to be sort of rather idiosyncratic and academically insignificant difference. But what I would try to argue is that actually it is very significant. So what the difference is? The difference is that Machiavelli is pretty much happy with what he ends up, whereas international relations is pretty much frustrated with the same conclusion. So Machiavelli sees no problem with this kind of situation, which, yes, is paradoxical, but for him, is pretty much okay. 
Whereas in international relations, it always creates some kind of a frustration. So where does this frustration come from? I have to say that at first, I myself was sort of frustrated with certain ways in which international relations theory try to argue. And for example, my favorite, my favorite example of, of this kind of argument, which I for a very long period of time thought was unacceptable. You can find it in uh, the book by Henry Kissinger, which is Diplomacy. And there, at some point, he uh, argues about the end of the Cold War. And his argument about the end of the Cold War, I'm almost quoting. Uh, if it's not exact, it's just like minor variations, right? Not in substance. At some point, he says, George Cannon was certainly right in arguing that sooner or later, through this or that exercise of power, the Soviet Union would collapse. I was thinking, come on, give me a break. What kind of a theory it is? Could you be a little bit more precise sooner or later? Through this exercise of power, through that exercise of power. And what do you actually mean by power? And how exactly would it collapse? This is my expectation from theory. Not this, you know, pronouncement of a wise man, oh, sooner or later, from this or that, this or maybe something else would happen. What kind of theory? And I was uh, thinking along these lines until I actually started rereading McKinley. And the rediscovered for myself that quite often this is exactly how he argues. For example, he would say, you have potentially two models as a prince. You can either rely on mercenaries or you can raise your own army. OK, fine, so you have two models. One should be better, one should be worse, right? But no. Machiavelli tells us, if you raise your own army, then maybe you keep your principle, oh sorry, if you rely on mercenaries, then depending on the circumstance, maybe you keep your principality, but maybe you lose it. And if you raise your own army, then you are likely to keep your principality no matter what, unless a greater force is applied persistently. Wow. That sounds pretty much like Kissinger to me. <laughs> and as I was continuing the reading around it, I suddenly discovered for myself that that for Machiavelli, at least in his own understanding of the matter, was not at all a case of theoretical sloppiness. That actually he believed that in this particular field, this is the only way to argue. Hmm, that made me think, and that made me look in, into other similar sort of pronouncements in international relations literature. And some of them I found, looking at them from this angle, rather interesting. Because, for example, if you look at one of the first sort of professional texts on international relations, which is long before Car, but still, which is David Hume's essay on the balance of power. Yes, we have to be cautious, it's a political essay, right? So we perhaps should not be expecting too much of a theoretical rigor there. And yet, it is a political essay written and actually rewritten a number of times by certainly a first-class philosopher, the best of his time. So what does he write? In writing, he, he actually writes many things there. But at bottom, what he is saying is very Machiavellian again. And this again is not surprising, because in another essay, Hume was saying that, look, Machiavelli has told us everything there is to know about political theory. Maybe we should add something about political economy. But as far as politics is concerned, Machiavelli has already said everything. 
So he's quite happy with that. And not surprisingly, he is restating Machiavellian argument when he is saying that the balance that it, the balance of power which is practiced in Europe today is different from the balance of power that was practiced by Greek city-states because with Greek city-states the balance of power surely was in place but it resulted spontaneously, independently of anyone's policies or intentions. Whereas in the Europe of today, of David Hume, for the first time in history we have the balance of power as an outcome of a deliberate policy by a number of actors and the nature of this policy, something which did not exist in Greece, is the care of the, about the stability of the whole, which is Europe. And that is why, actually, Hume is saying, this is why I, not only as a man, but also as a British citizen, have a vested interest in the welfare of not just Britain, but also Germany, Spain, Italy, and even France itself. <laughs> so, actually you can find a more elaborate, more sophisticated analysis of this whole situation in Foucault in his late uh, lectures on security, where he says basically the same thing. Because of how the balance of the principle of the balance of power was formulated within the Westphalian system, it actually obliged all states to care not only for their power, but to care for the power of other states as well. Because if those other states would mismanage their power, that would throw the whole system out of balance. And for Foucault, that has some very important implications. Uh, in history. But, coming back to Hume, having stated this idea of the balance of power, Hume then argues two things, one of which he argues quite successfully, and the other one miserably. So the thing which he argues successfully is why Britain should oppose any uh, attempts to create a universal monarchy in Europe. This is sort of the easy part. And this is what realism always knew how to argue. Then comes the second part. And the second part is, where should Britain stop? Because sometimes things get not so clear cut. Yes, France used to be the main enemy, so to speak, because it used to be the main aspirant for a universal monarchy. But maybe it no longer is. And if it is no longer the major aspirant for universal monarchy, then we have to stop somewhere. But how do we stop? And at this point, Hume says something that I only pray for the prudence of British foreign policy. And as the most attentive historians uh, have noticed, of course, immediately, a sight of David Hume at prayer is a bizarre thing. <laughs> but this is what he says. And he prays because he cannot argue. And this is where he mentions prudence. Wow, that's interesting. Especially if from that point, and uh, just to uh, repeat briefly, this is what you have in international relations theory ever since. You open Kenneth Walt, who argues about national interest, balance of power, where it is very rigorous, very theoretical, very clear. And it says, if anarchy, then the balance of power, if the balance of power, the system will settle into a bipolar system. But then, shouldn't the system destroy itself? Well, then it's prudence and it will not. Okay, fine, but where does exactly prudence come from? And what exactly is it? 
no answer. You go from realism to constructivism, you read someone like Alexander Wendt, totally different uh, theory, totally different view of international relations, but somewhere towards the end of the book, necessarily, there is this reference to prudence without any theoretical account as to, okay, but what exactly makes states prudent? So if we cannot find any convincing answer after him, let's try to look before him. And there we find some interesting things. We go, for example, to John Locke. And John Locke, when it comes to international relations, and as usual, that comes somewhere, like almost like a footnote, you know, very briefly, just one paragraph. Uh, when he says, well, in this field, really, we can only rely on the prudence of people entrusted with this activity. Very nice. Uh, and of course, this is an interesting bit. In the 60s, this paragraph is picked up by Irwin Crystal, Irwin Crystal Senior, one of the founders of the neoconservative movement, who says, Look, even John Locke is frustrated, right? So prudence is the last resort. And then how does Irving Crystal use this argument? Well, he used this argument, well, because prudence is the last resort, and prudence comes from experience. So you all intellectuals, shut up and leave the matters to those who are entrusted with the conduct of foreign policy. They know better. But is it really what Locke is saying? Because if we reconstruct Locke's concepts, uh, it is interesting to see what actually problem Locke is trying to solve. And this is not such a big puzzle because uh, Locke is very explicit about it. He tries to give us a theory of government. What is perhaps less obvious is that theory of government was actually a rather new thing before Locke and Montesquieu and the rest of them. Because before that, European states were so constructed that they were much, much comfortable with wars than they were with peace and governments. To give you an example from a period which kind of immediately precedes Locke, when England was just stepping on this way towards becoming a fiscal military state, as some historians would call it later. Wars were becoming longer and longer. They were being conducted at faraway locations, increasingly so. And the English state knew how to deal with it. They knew how to put together these huge armies and how to keep these huge, increasingly huge armies functional away from home for extended periods of time which led even to sort of comic situations. Uh, if you read from that period, someone like Fielding, you know, who describes uh, characters who spent so much time fighting in the French army that they have forgot, forgotten how to speak English properly without <coughs> learning to speak French. So that was pretty much the life of the period, right? So this, the state could handle. But when wars ended, what the state did, it simply unleashed this crowd of unemployed, uneducated killers back onto their home territories so that the endings of war for the local population often turned out to be bigger catastrophes than wars themselves. So Locke, in many ways, he's trying to address this problem. He's trying to tell the state what does it mean to govern properly, right? But when it comes to international relations, he does not extend his project there. He says, oh no, there we can leave it as it is. Why? One uh, explanation, and this is an explanation of Melvin Crystal, would be, well, because there's no republic, there's no commonwealth, uh, outside of the state borders, so you 
obviously there's no government. You cannot govern there. If you cannot govern there, then the theoretical project on government should stop at state borders. But there is at least one reason to believe that maybe Locke had something else in mind. And what he may be had in mind, although we cannot be 100% sure of that, is that when it comes to international relations, precisely, yes, because it's a different realm, it's a different kind of experience, we need a different kind of knowledge. And this different kind of knowledge to help us out there is actually prudence. So prudence is not a second best kind of thing. So when you do not, no longer have resources to understand or to organize things, then you fall back on prudence. But prudence is simply a different kind of knowledge, a different kind of rationality. Do we have any evidence to support this? Well, actually we have. Let's go just a little bit more into history from not very far away, from Locke to Hobbes. And when Hobbes speaks about prudence, this is precisely how he speaks about prudence. Because he says, again, mentioning prudence very briefly, he says, <coughs> definite knowledge of the effects of our action is properly called providence, and that belongs to the courts. Available to us knowledge of the effects of our actions is what properly called prudence. And then he discusses prudence, and he discusses how prudence is different from other kinds of knowledge. And again, this is not surprising, because throughout the Leviathan, what Hobbes does, apart from, of course, building up his own project, he argues with Aristotle, right? But arguing with Aristotle also means that he, at the very least, knows what Aristotle was talking about. And when Aristotle was talking about, this is precisely what he meant. He meant that there are different kinds of knowledge, three, scientific, artistic, or instrumental, right, what we would call, and practical reason. And practical reason, what Aristotle still called phrenesis, is what later, with the Romans, and more specifically with uh, Cicero, uh, would become prudentia, and then prudence. So prudence, to repeat, is not some kind of a rational wasteland. When we run out of rational resources, when we can no longer understand situations, when we no longer know how to argue, then we sort of take this kind of ace in a hole, right, and call it prudence which is pretty much what uh, really in international relations theory has been, have been doing until recently. Prudence is something altogether different. Now, the next question then would be that if, for example, uh, as I mentioned uh, just now, Aristotle had a very clear understanding of what prudence is and in fact had extensive discussions of prudence in some of his works, specifically in politics and rhetoric, then if we want to understand prudence, why don't we go straight to Aristotle? Because later on we only sort of hear echoes of this specific treatment of uh, prudence. And uh, this echoing goes on until the beginning of the 20th century when first Heidegger picks up this theme and then later on after the Second World War and in some ways in response to Heidegger, Bourdieu does the same in France. So if we want to figure out the nature of prudence for ourselves, why don't we go to Aristotle? Now, actually many have <coughs> 
suggested something like this in talking about politics generally. And the most well-known argument uh, belongs to Anskov, who argued that, look, one of the reasons why our ethical and in some ways political uh, constructions do not work is that because for them in order to work, they have to be grounded in monotheistic divinity. In other words, they can only work in a thoroughly Christian world because without this support of Christian religion, many of the modern ethical and political categories become empty, they lose their power. So if this is the case, so if we want some kind of new politics or a new kind of ethics, let's go back to the ancients, and especially to Aristotle. I mean, it's so attractive after all, in many respects. And we get there everything that we might need. Others have argued, and rightly so, that this is not going to work. And one reason why this straightforward uh, maneuver away from Christianity will not work is that, of course, Aristotelian thought, for example, is certainly not Christian, but it's certainly not monotheistic, so to speak, in the, in the way we usually talk about monotheism. But it is in equal measure impossible without the specifically Aristotelian idea of the polis, which is so different from the modern state that the whole construction cannot be simply transported from pre-Christian Greece into the contemporary, allegedly post-Christian situation. So if the diagnosis, so to speak, of the situation is indeed correct, and the problem is uh, in this weakening or loss of uh, religious, spiritual authority, which at some point underpinned political and ethical constructions, then the solution should be not in going back to pre-Christianity, but in examining actually explicitly post-Christian constructions, that is, political and ethical constructions put forward by people who consciously, deliberately, explicitly try to create something which would not require the support of Christian religion. And of course, if you are looking for this kind of person, whom do you see? Yen Machiavelli. Because this is in many ways what he is doing. Because unlike Cicero, certainly unlike uh, St. Augustine before him, this is what Machiavelli is. He is perhaps the first post-Christian among political thinkers. That is, the first political thinker who, having already lived through Christianity, unlike the ancients, uh, including Cicero, is already trying to put forward <coughs> something which is not predicated on Christian metaphysics, Christian uh, ethics, and Christian politics. So, I don't have much time for that, but I've pretty much uh, set my introduction. What I want to say now, as sort of concluding uh, this part, is that some people have argued, and I really buy into this argument, uh, some historians have argued, that what in many ways, Machiavelli is doing uh, in order to make his project work and why he is, by and large, happy with his project in ways in which uh, modern realists cannot be happy, is he re-articulating Aristotelian idea of prudence in this new post Christian, if you wish, condition. 
And the nature, the main thrust of this rearticulation consists in the fact that whereas in Aristotle prudence or the mastery of practical reason is pretty much the function of individual's character, which again is a very special uh, theme, a very special topic. For Machiavelli, prudence serves the goal which I have already mentioned in the beginning, which is this special stability uh, Machiavelli aims at, which may be called revolutionary stability, if you wish. So how does Machiavelli achieve this goal? Well, this, I think, is the most interesting part of the whole story, which leads to the next sort of part of, of my overall research, the one which I said would be sort of too technical, but to outline briefly what is going on there. What Machiavelli is trying to revise, so to speak, or to think differently, and what he indeed thinks differently from what we are used to, and that is why he is happy with this strange conclusions that you may keep your principality or you may lose your principality because this is not what really concerns him. What he thinks differently, he thinks differently from us the relation between the rule and the case, the rule and the individual case. Because we, the way we think about the relation between the rules and cases, roughly falls into one of the two paradigms which in international relations, but not only, are usually presented as the logical of the consequences or the logical of appropriateness. So we either do whatever we do because we want to achieve certain outcomes, or we do whatever we do because this is what the rule tells us is appropriate to do. Now, Machiavelli is doing neither of that. His uh, kind of approach is uh, much more flexible, much more discursive, much more rhetorical than what we are used to in theorizing. And there is a very good reason for that. And actually a very uh, obvious reason. Uh, it's, you don't even have to know anything about McKinley apart from the dates of his life to know what the reason is. Uh, to simplify things, the reason, quite simply, is that Machiavelli died 15 years, 50 years before Descartes was born. So the modern scientific method was not invented yet. It, uh, let alone has not become dominant. So in that sense, Machiavelli was much freer than, so to speak, uh, uh, realist, uh, realists were who, to stress again, to repeat what I said, who started their realism as a specific academic activity within the context of modern universities, and that, of course, means within the context of modern science, which then, in the beginning of the 20th century, and pretty much up till now, was dominated by a certain idea, or, and I would say is dominated, by a certain idea of the scientifically proper method. So scientifically proper method, which for Machiavelli was not known, which for him was not relevant, which for him certainly didn't act as any kind of either guidance or constraint. So just in the same way in which Aristotle was pre-Christian, Machiavelli was pre-Cartesian. And therefore, we cannot just like fall back on Machiavelli and say, oh, look, Kissinger is saying the same thing as Machiavelli did, therefore Kissinger is good, right? Because the trick is not how to go back to pre-Cartesian, the trick just as if we are to follow Machiavelli, both in his kind of approach to politics and in his method, then we actually have to argue 
against Machiavelli because the only viable for us position to argue would be not falling back on the pre Cartesian innocence, but to argue from a post Cartesian position, whatever that might be. So I want to stop. And I guess this is where I have to stop, given the time. Thank you very much.